Morning, Sunrise family. It's great to see you. I can't wait to get to worship today. It's going to be a fantastic day. We're going to take communion. Make sure you get communion elements. And we're going to... Hang on. Too much caffeine? Or am I trying to set you up for some beautiful messages from our Lord through our pastor Jerome today about what it means to slow down and focus and, and kind of go through life in, in, in a way that Jesus would go through life. He, he teaches us his ways. And, and in addition to that, he teaches us how to pray. He teaches us so many things. And that's what communion's about too. He's gonna bring us to his table, a table we don't deserve to be invited to. And we're gonna understand what it means to have his body broken for us and his blood shed to cleanse our sins. So I will encourage you to go get your elements and have them ready because we're gonna take communion together at the end of the sermon today. I wanna tell you about a couple other things and I'll try to speak slowly. My tendency is to go fast and I bet I'm not alone. I bet a lot of you are. But let's take our time. Get your Bible. We're going to be in Psalm 23 today, and we're going to be in Matthew 11 as we continue our series called With All My Heart. Hey, I'm just so thankful for our deacons and, and all those that helped yesterday. A beautiful service, a celebration of life for Linda Shirey, a, a woman that the Lord sent here, and she loved on our little ones, and we're just a great person in, in our nursery and in so many areas. And and praying for the Shireys and the loss of Linda and the recent loss of, of their son too. So lift up Rick and Chasey and the whole family. But thank you for loving them yesterday. And I know you're gonna to continue to pray for them. Hey, if you, if you wanna find out what's going on at Sunrise, go to sunrisefallbrook.com. You can give online, you can do all kinds of things. And if you don't find what you're looking for online, email me, greg at sunrisefallbrook.com. Love to hear from you, love to talk with you. Let's see, other things going on. Oh yes, this big super chili bowl contest we're doing on February 10th at 2 p.m. You gotta be there for that. If you can't be, I'll pack up some chili and send it to you or deliver it. No worries, we wanna do it together. But that's coming up at 2 p.m. on Saturday the 10th. You're gonna be able to taste chili, uh, buy chili to take it home for the Super Bowl the following day. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So come on out for that. And then don't forget on uh, the 14th, which is Valentine's Day at 7 p.m. that evening is when Lent begins and we'll be having our Ash Wednesday service. All right, I think you're caught up. I hope I paced myself, but stay tuned for a beautiful message from Pastor Jerome in reference to with all my heart and following Jesus. You know, let's pray together right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this very moment in time that you've blessed us with. We know you're not a God of coincidence and, and we're here to listen to your word. And as we listen to your word, I pray that we would just fall deeper in love with you, Heavenly Father, because out of the overflow of our heart, the mouth speaks and we want to speak encouragement and love to this world that needs you so desperately. We thank you for this upcoming communion where you invite us to your supper table. We thank you for your amazing gift of grace. Let us cling to it and let us be ready to share it with any and everybody you put in our path. Now, I pray that you'd move Pastor Jerome aside and, and have your Holy Spirit come forth in power as we hear and, and your words today. Because it's always your word. It's the plumb line of truth. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we're so thankful. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. It's the first Sunday of February, and so we're going to gather around the Lord's table today. Looking forward to that. We're continuing our series with all my heart, and today we're going to look at two passages, one from Psalms and then in the Gospel of Matthew. So beautiful, beautiful psalm today. We all know this psalm and love it. Psalm 23. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then turn to Matthew chapter 11, the closing verses in that chapter, beginning at verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, today I thought we'd begin with a little word association game. I'm going to say several words, simple words, and then you tell me what they all have in common. All right, you ready? Here we go. Savor, meander, meditate, luxuriate, mosey, dawdle, linger, stroll. What would you say these different words all have in common? Think about that, because the answer is they all involve slowing down, right? I mean, think about it. It is impossible to do any one of these things I just mentioned without first slowing down. And that's not all. Here's another thing they all have in common. For the most part, these are words we rarely ever say or use anymore. Did you notice that? And most likely the reason we rarely use these words is because we rarely do them. These days, we just don't have time anymore to dawdle or meander or mosey along, right? Heck no. I mean, what do you think I am, a slacker? My schedule's way too busy for that. I've got people to see and things to do. I've got all kinds of important stuff I've got to get done. I've got deadlines to meet and jobs to finish and miles to go before I sleep. But the truth is, truly, today, the vast majority of us feel constantly overwhelmed, don't we? So often just feel overwhelmed by all the relentless demands on our lives and on our time. And we have this nagging perpetual anxiety that we're never actually going to get around to doing all the things that still need to get done. So what do we do? We throw up our hands in frustration and we say things like, there's just not enough time in the day. Or I swear, time is going faster. It's just going by faster than it ever has before. And then what do we do? What's the answer to that dilemma? I know. You know, let's create some time-saving digital devices that'll help us be more efficient and better able to keep up with all the hustle and bustle of life, right? I mean, we got to keep up. You got to keep up with everything. That's the most important thing in life. And if you snooze, you lose. So let's create technology that will allow us to do more in less time. Let's give everybody a cell phone, <laughs> including our children, so people can call you or text you at any time of the day and reach you and where you can constantly check your email or Twitter for the latest updates in this ever-changing world of ours. That's the ticket. Now we can fill every block of unused time with even more work and more information and more entertainment right there at our fingertips. But then, folks, then, what's the result of that? Chris Greer writes, day after day, year after year, life is filled with overactive busyness. Stressful hustling and posting and the anxiety-ridden compulsion to do more with less instead of doing less with more. Our days become decades, he says, and all of this trickles down into our lives of faith. You know, years ago, back in 2011, a man named Nicholas Carr wrote this bestseller called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. And here's what he said. What the net seems to be doing is chipping away my capacity for concentration and contemplation. Whether I'm online or not, my mind now expects to take, take in information the way the net distributes it in a swiftly moving stream of particles. Once, he says, I was a scuba diver in the sea of words. Now, now I zip along the surface like a guy on a jet ski. And again, folks, this was written back in 2011. You can only imagine how much truer it is today. Folks, here's my assertion. As much as we all like getting more stuff done and the faster the better, speed is the enemy of depth and nuance and subtlety, attention to detail, reflection, learning, and rich relationships with God and with one another. It's an enemy to all those things. It is now, it always has been, and it always will be. You know, there's a well-known story about a particular pastor of a megachurch who was really starting to feel the weight 
in the stress of all the demands of ministry. His church was super successful. The word of God was being faithfully preached and thousands of lives were being touched every week. But he just kept having this deep inner sense that something's wrong. You know, something's missing from his own personal spiritual life and his relationship with the Lord. So he decides to call up his mentor, who happened to be Dallas Willard, the famous Christian philosopher and author, and he asked him, what do I need to do to become the me I really want to be? There was a long silence on the other end of the phone, and then Dallas said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. So quickly, the pastor just jots that down in his prayer journal, and he says, okay, I got it, got it. What else? And again, a long silence. And then Dallas finally says, there is nothing else. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Wow. Folks, for the next couple of weeks, as we're going to be focusing on cultivating our relationship with God. And then we're going to look at life with ourselves and finally life with others. But just a reminder, our goal in this new series is not simply to learn even more new information, but to actually experience real transformation as we allow the Holy Spirit to shape us and form us into the image of Christ. And the first transformative practice to help us abide in Christ and root us in His way is to slow down. That simple and that challenging. N.T. Wright puts it like this. He said, it is only when we slow down our lives that we can catch up to God. You know, think about that statement for a minute. You know, what a paradox that is. The only way to catch up to God is by slowing down not by speeding up. In other words, unlike us, God almost exclusively travels in the slow lane of life, not on the expressway. Have you ever noticed that? He never moves quite as quickly as we'd like for him to. So the truth is, we're much more likely to run on ahead of him than we are to walk side by side with him, you know, at his pace and in step with his rhythm. That's why the scriptures constantly talk about our walk with God, not our race after God or to God. The Apostle John sums it all up really clearly when he says, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Christ did. And the prophet Isaiah declares, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses. We will ride off on swift horses. Folks, you know, this prophetic passage was written thousands of years ago, and yet here we are today, and we're still doing the very same thing. You know, I don't know about you, but the faster I'm forced to go, the more stressed out and irritable and frustrated I become. The faster I go, the more I become focused on myself and on my productivity and on my ability to get things done or lack of ability, rather than entrusting all things to my heavenly Father who cares for us and who does all things well. See, the mantra of our day and the ra rallying cry of consumerism and capitalism is more, bigger, and faster. And without a doubt, speed is one sure route to emotional stimulation and fleeting pleasure. There's no doubt about it. But slowing down, folks, slowing down is God's pathway to true depth, enduring satisfaction, and lasting fulfillment. So how can we do that? How can I know if I'm truly walking with God than simply running ahead of Him? Well, for one thing, the Good Shepherd does not lead us into chaos, in discord, in constant confusion. No. When I'm walking in step with Him, He makes me lie down in green pastures, as we just read. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Or as the Apostle Paul says, our God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. 
So check the fruit, right? Is the fruit of my life peace and rest? Or is it constant chaos and disharmony? Does the rhythm of my life allow space for me to learn from Jesus and to grow in gentleness and humility? He says, come to me for I am gentle and humble of heart. Or do I feel like I'm constantly carrying around a yoke that is heavy and oppressive and as a result, I find myself being defensive and never or rarely at rest. Folks, now don't misunderstand. Following Jesus as his disciple and apprentice is not a cakewalk, you know. In fact, Jesus tells us in order to follow him, we must first deny ourselves and take up our cross. And that's not easy. You know, we take up our cross even if that means going places we wouldn't normally go. See, as disciples of Jesus, we will definitely go through many trials and tribulations. But nevertheless, as the psalmist says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. The first step in learning to love the Lord with all my heart is to slow down and to make intentional space in my life to meet with him and be with him on a regular daily basis. Why? So that my soul can be restored and I can truly be refreshed in him. I mean, listen, how can I ever hope to refresh anybody else unless I first refresh myself? Here's what we read in the book of Job, of all places, Job 37, 14. Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Now, without a doubt, Job receives all kinds of bogus advice from his well-meaning friends. But here, at least here, we see a gem, a little gem of true wisdom. Folks, when was the last time you just stopped? Stop what you're doing, stop talking, stop striving, and simply consider all the wondrous works of God. You know, last time I checked, the only way to stop is by first slowing down. I mean, we don't just slam on the brakes unless we're running into some kind of unexpected accident. No, we ease on the brakes, don't we? Until we slowly come to a full stop. And then what happens? You know, what happens when we finally do that? What is it like when you really allow yourself to slow down, sit still, you know, take a deep breath and look around you with your eyes and your heart wide open. What do you see that you never really noticed before? You know, what do you feel and smell and hear? We truly are surrounded by a world of wonders. God made wonders, but as Jesus says, only those who have eyes to see and ears to hear will ever stop long enough to recognize it. Like Friday morning, I was coming home from church and I looked up and oh my goodness, there was the biggest and the most beautiful rainbow I have ever seen. I don't know how many of you saw that, but I would not have ever noticed it unless I first stopped to consider the wondrous works of God. Folks, stopping is probably the most countercultural and counterintuitive action that we can take. And especially in a culture that celebrates constant action and multitasking and high-speed performance. Again, consider the life of Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, we read about a blind man named Bartimaeus. He's sitting by the side of the road begging. But one day, when he heard that Jesus was passing by, he began to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Have mercy on me. Well, many of the people standing around that day rebuked him, Mark says. They told him to be quiet. You know, shut up, you old fool. Don't bother the master. He's way too busy for someone like you. But the blind man just shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And that's when we read these beautiful words, simple words. Mark 10, 49, it says Jesus stopped and said, call him. Folks, don't miss the context here. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus had just told his disciples, listen, we're going to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. 
So that's in their heads. Folks, you talk about a time of high intensity. Think of all the anxious anticipation. What's he talking about? Is it going to happen today? And what about this growing crowd of people that were suddenly gathering around Jesus as he walked along the road? Would someone in this faceless crowd try to hurt him or, or betray him or, or set a trap for him? It's times like this that we typically move along even faster than we normally would, right? We certainly don't slow down in times like that. We speed up. Let's just put our head down and get out of here. But not Jesus, say. Not Jesus. Jesus stopped and said, call that man. Call him. So they called out to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. He wants to see you. And throwing his cloak aside, Mark says, the blind man jumped to his feet and came running to Jesus. And Christ healed him right there on the spot. Immediately he received his sight, Mark says, and followed Jesus along the road. How amazing is that? But that's not all. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan. He also stopped, didn't he? He stopped along a very dangerous, deserted road to Jericho in order to help a man who had been mugged and robbed and left for dead. See, earlier, both a religious priest and a temple worship leader had walked right past him on the other side of the road. But this hated foreigner, this half-breed Samaritan, stopped and he had mercy on the man. Folks, when we dare to slow down and actually stop, that's when we make room for God to act in miraculous and unexpected ways, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of other people. Jesus stopped, Mark says, even when the timing seemed way less than perfect, even when he was deeply preoccupied with so many other things. The question is, Will we, you know, will we dare to do the same? See, Jesus was often busy, absolutely. He was very busy, but he was never in a hurry. See, a hurried spirit is really a disordered spirit. It's the fruit of a soul in disarray. But whenever Jesus spent time with someone, you never get the sense that his mind was somewhere else, do you? Or that he was somehow looking over their shoulder to, to his next appointment. Chris Greer says, Jesus refused to allow his ministry to become manic. He was in no hurry. He didn't serve microwaved miracles from a buffet line. He looked every person in the eye and gave them his undivided time and attention. So how did he do that, right? That's the question. And, you know, don't say, well, it's because he was the divine son of God. I mean, yes, that's true, absolutely. But folks, the whole reason Jesus came to live among us is to show us what it means and what it looks like to live a fully human life, just as God intended from the very beginning. You know, Jesus was not like Clark Kent, who's hiding behind some disguise, while all along, he's really Superman. No. The scriptures are clear that the divine Son of God truly made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, he emptied himself, is what the Bible says. He, he was made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Okay, so in the same way then, Jesus didn't come to turn us into some kind of otherworldly angelic beings. He came to make us more human, <laughs> not less. He came to show us what it looks like to live lives that truly reflect the beautiful image of God in all that we do, in all that we say. See, it wasn't enough for Adam and Eve to be created in the image of God, evidently. They wanted more. They insisted on more. So after they were tempted by the serpent, their desire was to be like God himself and decide for themselves, you know, what's, what's right and what's wrong. They wanted to transcend their creaturely nature and identity and become something they were never intended to be. That right there is the tragic condition of fallen men and women to this very day. That's really what sin is all about. So what happens? Jesus, the second Adam comes. He shows us a new way to be human. See, he's God's original prototype for humanity. He shows us what it looks like to live a life as a grateful, trusting child of God. So Adam and Eve defiantly eat from the forbidden fruit in the garden. 
But Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Adam and Eve rebel by daring to cross over these loving boundaries that God had set for them, for their own good, for their own health and safety. But Jesus, the second Adam, says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Adam and Eve fall for the lies of the serpent when he tells them you will certainly not die if you disobey God. He's just holding out on you. He knows that when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God instead of like mere finite humans. But again, Jesus says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. See, all along the way, Jesus is showing us what it means to live a truly abundant, spirit-filled life as humans created in the very image of God. That's why the Bible says that Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters because he's gladly taken on human flesh, just like you and me. In the book of Hebrews, we read, for surely it's not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's now able to help those who are being tempted. Folks, if we're really serious about growing in our life with God and loving him with all our heart, the first practice that we must learn is how to intentionally make space and time to actually be with him, just as Jesus did, you know, through solitude, silence, and listening prayer. Over and over again throughout the Gospels, we read how Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Or as the message says, as often as possible, Jesus withdrew to out-of-the-way places for prayer. And Matthew tells us Jesus went up into the hills, up into the mountains by himself to pray. And then he goes on to say, he stayed there alone late into the night. See, all these things, these are all slowing down actions, not speeding up actions. Folks, if we don't ever make space to slow down and connect with the one who reveals to us our deepest and truest identity, then we'll never discover who God really is or who we really are. Rich Velotis writes, there's a severe lack of depth in our lives and communities because we have allowed ourselves to be swept up by a world under the influence of addictive speed. We desperately need a way of thinking and living, he says, that isn't captive to the powers of efficiency, speed, and performance. So true. And why is this true? Again, because we're constantly tempted today to live at a pace that's not only ungodly, you know what? It's actually inhuman. We were never meant to live at that pace. We're constantly in way too big a hurry, and it's gradually crushing our souls from the inside out. You know, recently I read a blog written by a young Christian woman, and here's what she said. I love to walk down to the mall in the center of town a few blocks away. There's a farmer's market there every Wednesday morning where I can buy fresh local fruit and veggies, baked goods, roasted nuts, and warm flaky croissants. I wander down on my day off, she says, seeing what I can see along the way. A city is a fascinating place. But there comes a point, she says, when I am only a few streets away from the center when things speed up. The volume of the crowd starts to push in, the pace picks up, the crowd has its own pace, and it's practically impossible to slow down and force the mob to sidestep me in the congestion. These are workers on their lunch break, executives with meetings to get to and deadlines to meet, friends who are meeting and women who are shopping, stepping over buskers, hats, and loose change. It's a buzz, and I love it, but it's fast-paced, and it's hard to walk slowly when the people pressing around you are in a hurry. I have to keep in step with the crowd, follow the pace of the group, keep up or get knocked over. At first I found it confronting, annoying, she says. I wanted to yell at everyone, slow down. I wanted to notice things. I wanted to stop and appreciate the sculptures in the street and the architecture of the old buildings. But it seemed that everyone else had somewhere they needed to be and they were already late. It's hard to slow down in a fast-paced world, she observes. The world is changing rapidly. 
And we need to keep up or become irrelevant for our kids to be equipped and our businesses to be successful and our churches to be relevant, she says. We need to keep moving, keep changing, keep pushing. All right. So, folks, I ask you today, have you ever felt like that? You know, can you identify with what this lady's saying? Because I can, of course. But, folks, listen. The one who successfully completed the most important divine mission ever assigned to anyone totally disagrees with this woman's very familiar assessment. Today, our Lord Jesus is inviting us to discover a fresh new rhythm for living that will bring healing and wholeness to our souls. Are you tired, he asks? Worn out? Burned out on a religion based on a bunch of do's and don'ts and addicted to consumerism? Then come to me, he says. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, he promises. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. See, Jesus, the true human, was able to live the life he did because of the constant unhurried time and energy that he put into being alone with his father in prayer. It didn't matter what everyone else was doing. He refused to march to the loud, hectic rhythms of the culture. And instead, what did he do? He set a whole new pace. It's the revolutionary pace of the kingdom of God. And folks, it's a pace he longs for you and me to follow as well. You know, let's face it, we Protestants can get really noisy. Our Sunday worship services are often filled with nonstop sound and activity, and there's rarely any opportunity for silence of any kind. But the truth is, silent prayer is actually one of the greatest gifts we have to experience a deeply formed life in Jesus. Again, as Rich Velotis says, at the core of silent prayer is the commitment to establish relationship with God based on friendship rather than demands. Certainly, he says, there's a time to make requests, to petition God, to cry out in moments of need. But our verbal prayers best come out of moments of silence that energize and shape our words. In basic terms, he says, silent prayer is the practice of focusing our attention upon God through the simplicity of shared presence. It's a surrender of our words to be present with the word, with Jesus. You know, I once heard a very charming story about Mother Teresa. I love this. Evidently, one day, a reporter or a journalist asked her what she says to God. What do you say to God when you pray? And she answered, I don't talk, I simply listen. Um, okay, the interviewer said, then what, what is it that God says to you when you pray? And Mother Teresa answered, he doesn't say anything either. He also simply listens. You now the Apostle Paul put it like this in Romans, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't even know what we should pray for nor how we should pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. So beautiful. Folks, welcome to the joy and the mystery of silent contemplative prayer. This is something other than petitioning God. This is spirit to spirit, you know, heart to heart communication that transcends mere words. This is simply slowing down, being still, and holding hands with God in the beauty of silence. You know, that's what David called beholding God in wonder and in worship. One thing I ask from the Lord, he says, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And what a wonderful way to live. God, help me to live in that rhythm. Okay, so here's one more little story before we close. Recently, I heard about a pastor who went to a Christian retreat where many, many different churches were attending. So the main parking lot was packed 
with all these cars and church vans and buses from various states from all over. But as he walked to the meeting room, the message on one particular minibus really caught his eye. It was a sign that simply said, read the Bible fast and pray. Read the Bible fast, he thought. That's this church's motto? He'd never seen that before, so it was perplexing to him. But that's when it hit him. Two very important commas were missing on this sign, right? Two commas that had they been there would have changed the whole meaning. See, it should have said, read the Bible, comma, fast, comma, and pray. And of course he goes, aha, you know, that makes sense. But then something else hit him. Ironically, he said, the incorrect version describes the way many of us approach the scriptures. We don't regularly fast and pray, but we do quite regularly read our Bibles fast. Folks, besides practicing silent listening prayer, another way we can grow in our life with God is to learn to read the Bible slowly. See, the Bible, God's word, was never meant to inform us, but rather to form us and really transform us and shape our very hearts. Too often we read and study simply to learn more information, you know, more history, more facts, more, more Bible knowledge, theological insight. And there's certainly a place for that, absolutely. It is vital that we study and come to understand how the entire Bible is really one great narrative of God's amazing plan of redemption. But let me ask you this, when was the last time you picked up your Bible and read it slowly? and meditatively, more, more like a love letter than a scholarly textbook. Robert Mulholland says that the point of formational reading versus informational reading is to allow the text to master you. And reading the Bible, he says, this means we come to the text with an openness to hear, to receive, to respond, to be a servant of the word rather than a master of the text. See, this is something our elders do every Friday morning during our prayer time together. We simply sit still with the Bible open in front of us, and then we allow God to speak first to us through his word, and only then do we respond to what we've heard. We ask God to highlight a single word or a verse or a story, whatever he'd like to say to us individually and to the church as a whole, and then we simply sit still with it and contemplate it and let it saturate our hearts and our souls. That makes all the difference in the decisions we have to make as elders at the church. Chris Greer, again, he puts it like this. He says, as you sit with the words in his text, you sit with him. When you take it slowly, you take him seriously. When you meditate on his word, when you listen for him to speak through it, when you memorize and internalize it, you interact with him in ways that make your relationship real and strong, vibrant and immediate. In other words, folks, when we read the scripture slowly and meditatively like that, we're not simply reading in order to finish another chapter, right, or to get through the text. We're reading in order to allow the text to get through to us. Reading the Bible like this means reading with the desire to engage rather than be entertained, and to be formed rather than simply be informed, and to allow our living Lord to reach our hearts rather than just teach our minds. So this is the avenue to true transformation as we allow the Holy Spirit to speak deeply into our innermost being and to stir up worship and wonder and gratitude and confession. So folks, this week, I want to invite you to try this beautiful discipline in the privacy of your own home, you know, maybe in your backyard or maybe in some, some place out in nature. Find a quiet place. You know, open the Bible to the Psalms or to some short passage in the Gospels, and instead of speed reading through it, just see what it feels like to actually slow down and savor God's Word. You know, meditate on it. Read it out loud if possible. Linger over it like a tree planted by streams of water. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Today, I truly sense Jesus saying to me and to you, you search the scriptures because you believe they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me so that I can give you this eternal life. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Amen.
Amen. That's what we want to do right now, folks. We're going to take communion. Let's just be still. Let's be quiet. Let's dare to go slow and relish this moment. There's nothing more important that we could do right now. There's nothing more healing than to silence all that inner noise and meet with our loving Lord around his banqueting table. So Shaylee's going to come. She's going to sing. And then we're going to take communion together. Let's do that together. Amen. Break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us drink wine together on our knees let us drink wine together on our knees when i fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun oh lord have mercy So in that Psalm 23, we read, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So there's no better way for us to come together in community and be still and hear from, the God, from God and slow down than taking communion together. When we do that, we're worshiping the Lord and we're also very aware of one another. We do this as brothers and sisters in Christ. So Jesus takes the bread, he gathers his family around and he says, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. He takes the cup and says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Savor it. Drink it in remembrance of me. So let's do that. I invite you to take the elements that you have there, even at your own home, and take together. Take and eat, Jesus says. This is my body broken for you. And then we take the cup. Drink this in remembrance of me. This is how much I love you. Let's do that together in Jesus' name. Father, how much and how desperately we need to just take time out. Slow down. Be with you so that you can speak to our hearts and transform our lives. We give you great thanks today, Lord. Help us to live at the pace that Jesus shows us, that leads to eternal life, and to come away from all the noise and the clutter that's truly suffocating our souls. We give you great praise today, Father, for this new day, a new day to worship and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.